Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, listeners. We've got a good topic on the deck today, so please help me welcome Dr. Yami Kazorla Lancaster. Oh, I did it. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much for having me, Jennifer. Well, thank you. So as I was mentioning to Dr. Yami before we hit record, that as I'm getting older, my taste for things like beef and meats is decreasing and my desire for vegetarian meals is increasing, which is a good thing because I know, especially beef, not as good for our brains as as we need. So that is why I'm having her on today to talk about the benefits of a plant-based diet. So thank you so much. Why don't you start off by giving us your background and all the good stuff? Sure. Well, I am a pediatrician actually, so I don't see adults for medical care, but besides being a board certified pediatrician, I'm also certified in lifestyle medicine and I'm a national board certified health and wellness coach. So I do work with adults, just not as their doctor, but learning the principles of lifestyle medicine has really helped me be able to put all of these things that I've talked about for a long time, which is plant-based nutrition, exercise, adequate sleep, all of this into a nice framework that applies to so many different conditions, decreases our risk of several chronic conditions, but also just increases our well-being, our joy and our longevity, which is what most people are wanting, right? We want to live long, healthy, joyful lives. And so I spend a lot of my time when I'm not in the office, seeing the little kiddos talking about how we can make eating plant-based foods more accessible, more sustainable, and work it into your lifestyle in a way that makes sense to you because it doesn't have to be all or nothing. That's definitely true. Let's take half a step back. And can you explain, explain lifestyle medicine? Cause it's not really a phrase I've heard before, which yeah. surprises me. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you so much. So lifestyle medicine is a new specialty. And so, and that's probably why you haven't heard of it, but basically what it is, is the understanding that there are a lot of conditions, chronic conditions that we can not only prevent, but potentially reverse through lifestyle habits and behaviors. And it has six pillars. So one of them is nutrition, which is a predominantly plant-based diet. That is actually one of the pillars of lifestyle medicine, sleep, getting adequate restorative sleep, very important, moving your body, physical activity. Everybody knows that, right? But then there's going to be things like connection and stress reduction, and decreasing um, our exposure to risky substances. So the alcohol, the tobacco, and the things like that, which is one of the pillars of lifestyle medicine. So, you know, it's something that's part of our culture, part of our society, but understanding that having too much of these substances, exposure to these substances, increase our risk of chronic disease. Makes sense. And I do know, because my dad was diabetic, so I learned all the wrong things to do (laughs) through him that many people can reverse type two diabetes by changing their lifestyle. Yes. A lot of people don't know that. A lot of people think that, okay, everybody in my family has diabetes. They've all gotten heart disease. Well, it's inevitable. I might as well just continue eating what I eat and living the way I live because there's nothing I can do. And what's really empowering is to know that for some of these chronic conditions, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, you can change your diet and your lifestyle, and you can potentially reverse the conditions and completely get off medications. Now that's not going to be for everybody, but even the people that get, can't get completely off their medications, at least are able to reduce the amount or the quantity of medications that they're on. And that can make a big difference for somebody as far as their quality of life financially, you know, how much they're spending on medicine. And so it can make a really, really big effect in somebody's life. Okay. So before we jump into how to incorporate 
plant-based diet into our lives. Are you finding any a, a higher level of I don't like uh, acceptance or interest in the parents of your patients? For yeah, for a plant- sure. Uh, Oh, that's wonderful. My because, daughter's 30, so it's yes. it's not too late for her, but it's too late for me to influence her. Well, it's never too late for anybody, actually, because I have clients that are in their 80s that they're just like, you know, I'm ready to make a change and they influence their families, you know, so it's never too late, but it's also never too early because as a pediatrician, I talk about even in pregnancy before conception, think about what you're putting into your body, not as as a way to guilt or shame anybody, because that's not going to help anybody, but as a way of just being mindful. Yes. The things that we're doing, even before we get pregnant, while we're pregnant, while we're breastfeeding can really affect that child and their future risk and their habits. But yes, parents are more receptive now. And I think it's because we are seeing an influx of plant-based products on the market. And it's making people think, oh, Maybe there's a reason why there's over 20 commercially available plant milks out there. Do we have to be drinking milk all the time? Is milk a health food? You know, cow's milk is what I'm referring to. So yes, parents are more receptive. However, we happen to be immersed in the American culture, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, how many fast food restaurants are down the street? There's, we're surrounded also by a culture that, is encouraging us to overeat and eat a lot of ultra processed foods on one hand. And on the other hand is telling us to be thin and have a six pack. Does that make any sense? <laughs> no, <laughs> so not at all. <laughs> it's like both approaches are not working for us, obviously. So I think people are more open-minded to it, more receptive to it. They're going to stop and listen before they just immediately dismiss it. But we are struggling. We're struggling with how to get there. It's definitely a huge cultural shift. So every little incremental step, you know, each of us can take the better, but yeah, it's, it's going to be a slow, slow churn to, to flip the switch. So you were talking about commercially based plant milk, Mm -hmm. which made me think of the, like the impossible meats and the plant based uh, meat alternatives Mm-hmm. And I very much shy away from processed foods, mm-hmm. um, anything with a lot of stuff in it. And those things kind of, I don't want to say scare me, but they, I have not tried them mostly because they seem like super processed things. So I'm not sure that they're actually that much better than just like a grass fed beef or lean other lean meats. Well, let me address that in two parts. Okay. Okay. Um, Because I do have lots of things to say about this. (laughs) Okay, good. (laughs) I have lots of things to say about lots of things. Okay. So how much time do you have? Okay. So first of all, you're right. I would not consider it a health food, but think about what we're trying to do when we're making these products. What are we doing? We're replicating animal meat. That is true. So in order to replicate a hamburger, you have to put a lot of fat in there. You have to put a lot of salt in there. So these products are made for people that are trying to reduce their meat consumption. They do have a place in our society. And I am glad that they exist because there's more reasons to decrease our meat consumption or animal product consumption than just our health. And one of them is our environment. So for people that want to look into that, Cowspiracy is a really good documentary and there's more out there, but the, the earth is suffering because of animal agriculture and 99% of animals raised in this country are raised on concentrated animal feeding operations, 99%. So I know you said grass-fed, um, cows, I don't call it grass fed beef because beef can't eat. So grass fed cows, but most people are not eating that. Okay. Most people are eating meat, animal products from concentrated animal feeding operations. So, okay. That's the first point. The second point is when they have done comparisons between eating a meat burger opposed to a plant-based burger, even though, like I said, that plant-based burger is trying to replicate the meat burger. So for somebody that is really working hard to try to improve their health, that would not be the first place I would go. However, when they've done studies, they have shown 
that eating that plant-based burger probably is going to be a better choice if you're going to eat that kind of burger anyway. So if you're like, I want a greasy fatty burger, (laughs) it's better to go with the plant-based burger. And one of the main reasons is because it does benefit the gut microbiome and the gut microbiome is something that we're learning more and more about, but it is so important. And the way that those bugs in our intestines grow and, you know, develop and flourish is through prebiotics and prebiotics are only found in plants. They're, they're from fiber. And so even though that plant burger, yes, it's got fat, it's got the salt, it's got lots of different ingredients. It's still going to be a better choice. If you're trying to improve your health, if you're trying to decrease your risk of chronic disease and dementia and those kinds of things, I probably wouldn't be choosing that every day though. You know, this is kind of a once in a while, sort of, I want to get that, you know, that greasy burger feeling, but I I don't want to go for the saturated fat that's in the animal meat. Okay. That makes good sense. I'm a cyclist. And so there are times when it's like you're riding along and you've pretty much exhausted your fuel supply and you, you ride by a, a farm with cows and you're like, dang, I really want a burger. So now I know it's, I always know when my body needs some form of protein is when I start like having like cave woman mentality. <laughs> it's like, it oh, that so cow funny. looks really good. It's so, it is <laughs> really is weird. So funny. I um a decade ago, let's see, it's twenty twenty two. So yeah, about twelve years ago, went on a weight loss journey, and I lost a hundred pounds. And I did it by really severely restricting fat. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people say, "Oh, you got to cut out the carbs," which they mean starchy stuff, not vegetables. Um, but that they don't make that distinction. And so when I look at the meat alternative products, one, it's like, well, hello, they've got a lot of stuff in here I'm not sure about. And two, they got as much fat as the leaner beef, you know, the grass fed cow, as you said, Mm -hmm. then I, you know, they've got as much fat as what I normally eat. So why would I do this product that feels very processed and I wasn't super familiar with it until just now? So now I have, now I have good information. That's cool. I will definitely give one of those a try with, you know, whenever the burger craving hits, which thankfully isn't very often. So, yes, (laughs) but you know, and if they have a little bit more fat, they might be a little bit tastier when we make them at home. Sometimes I just skip making them at home and just, you know, every one, you know, three or four months, once, you know, once every quarter, basically I'll have a greasy burger. But then you got to pair it with a salad because if you pair it with French fries, it's like, oh, my body feels terrible. So. Yeah, a little too much, right? It kind of throws you over the edge. But yeah, yep. give it a try. You'd be surprised. And I haven't eaten meat for 11 years. And sometimes when I have one of those burgers, which isn't very often, it's usually on vacation or somewhere where that's one of the options, I get scared because it tastes like meat. Mm. And so you'd be surprised. Uh, the technology is getting pretty advanced in, in that area. So it could be a good alternative for people. Well, my daughter is a very big beef person and she has Crohn's. So I'm going to suggest it to her because it sounds like it might be like one more little step towards a little bit healthier nutrition. Everybody that I know that has Crohn's seems to battle what they, what, what they should eat with what makes their bodies feel good because of the flare-ups with the um, people. If the, any of the listeners don't know what Crohn's is, it's basically inflammation in your intestines and your colon. It's mm-hmm. very painful. So you don't want to eat stuff that causes a flare-up because it's not fun. So it's, it's a challenge because you said things like the fiber is important, but that's what freaks out their system. So it's it's a challenge. <laughs> But maybe this will be one one little notch closer to better for her. So the one thing I do know, because we're talking mostly to people who are caring for somebody with some form of dementia, and those of us that have done that or are doing that would prefer to avoid it in ourselves. I do know that being insulin resistant or diabetic can cause, can be like, I don't want to say cause Alzheimer's, but it's it's definitely not a good scenario to be in is our is is our insulin resistance at all tied to our meat consumption our animal consumption 
Yes, absolutely. And this is something that a lot of people don't understand. And I think what you were trying to say is when we have <laughs> these chronic conditions that are affecting our blood uh, blood vessels, diabetes is one of them, heart disease, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, those things are increasing our risk of developing dementia. So we know that when we can decrease those chronic conditions, we're also simultaneously decreasing our risk of developing dementia. Okay. When it comes to diabetes, a lot of people think sugar. So they mm -hmm. think, okay, if I eat sugar, I get diabetes. And if I have diabetes, I shouldn't eat sugar. But one of the things that's happening with diabetes is insulin resistance. And that's what happens over time with type two diabetes. It can happen with type one diabetes too. So di type one diabetes happens when you can no longer make insulin. However, even type one diabetics can develop insulin resistance because of their dietary and lifestyle choices, but definitely type two diabetes, it starts with insulin resistance. So your body is still making insulin. It just cannot listen to the signal. I can't listen to the insulin saying, Hey, bring the, you know, blood sugar into your muscles and into your, you know, blood vessels and those kinds of things. And so your blood sugar goes up high and insulin resistance is worsened through a high fat diet, particularly a diet that is high in saturated fat. And people don't know this. They're not told this when you are insulin resistant, it's going to make it seem like sugar is the problem because of mm -hmm. course you have more sugar and it stays higher in your blood vessels because you can't take it up into your muscles, you know? Um, and so then that's where the confusion is. But really, if you decrease your intake of fat, particularly saturated fat, which animal products, especially things like dairy, cheese, that's going to be our biggest source of saturated fat. There is some saturated fat in plant foods, but it's not very common. So coconut and coconut oil, which is what everybody thinks is like the saving grace of the world <laughs> has, is high in saturated fat. Chocolate is high in saturated fat, but really most of the rest of the plants are very low in saturated fat and higher in what we call mono unsaturated fat, like avocados and olive oil and things like that. So those fats can be more beneficial. And of course, they're also delicious and pleasant to eat. And so it helps eating more plants to include those foods in your diet, because it just makes it a more pleasant eating experience, you know, because in the standard American diet, we are used to eating quite a bit of fat. 30 to 40% of our calories are coming from fat in the standard American diet. So when people just go to just trying to eat vegetables and fruit, they're missing that fat. So you don't have to exclude the avocados. You don't have to exclude the nuts and seeds. If you want to use a little bit of olive oil, that's your choice. Um, but you want to stay away from the animal products and especially things like dairy and your, your meat because it's increasing your exposure to saturated fat. Oh, that makes me feel good that my personal trainer who was 50 or is 15 years older than me, <clears throat> when I had been working out and, and watching what I was eating and not seeing a lot of success, she basically told me, she did tell me, do not eat more than 30 grams of fat a day, period. Now, <laughs> Eggs have like five to seven grams of fat. So if you eat two eggs, you're already halfway done with your day and two eggs is not going to keep you full for very long. So that is how challenging that, that nutritional plan was, but I cannot eat a lot. I don't, saturated fat makes me actually queasy and too much fat, even, even in the good kind is, it just sends my system into just bleh. I don't feel good. You know, I just, I feel slow, sluggish, queasy, grumpy. <laughs> All the bad things. <laughs> yeah. It's like, you know, and it's, and it's very, you know, it's really easy to do. And I'm almost anti-restaurant at this point because, you know, I would like to go and enjoy a nice meal. I do not need it to be a thousand calories. That is insane. I do not need all the fat and glop and sodium and ugh. no, it's just, I do not know how you can eat a thousand calorie meal and still be hungry in four or five hours. It's like, it just kills me. So my husband and I are working very hard on really like stepping it. We're good cooks. So we're trying to step it up even more, like adding, 
you know, a little bit more acid on a certain thing, you know, a certain meal to bring out other flavors. And it's, it's fun. It's a nice hobby. You know, you just gotta be careful about how much of it you eat anyway. (laughs) So how would you suggest somebody who is all in on the traditional, you know, American diet? Cause I know what I did. I, I made all the changes slowly and that's what I would suggest somebody do if they want to start improving their nutrition is to just you know, like, don't, don't throw out all your meat. You know, the dogs might love you, but don't, don't do that. It's expensive and a waste. You know, I would say space out how often you eat it and just get rid of it. But what would you suggest people do? Where should they start? Like what's the, what's like the biggest bang for their buck they could do, you know, next week when they got to go grocery shopping. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. I started using a product that all you caregivers need to try. I started taking AG1 from Athletic Greens after my workouts because I needed a quick and healthy way to refuel my body. While there are lots of options, most don't taste great, and I don't eat or drink things that don't taste good. So what is AG1? Well, with one delicious, mildly tropical flavored scoop, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins and minerals, whole food sourced superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to fuel you for your crazy day ahead. AG1 helps support mental clarity throughout the day, and you know how important brain health is to this gal. It has over 7,000 five-star reviews and costs less than $3 a day, and you know your time is worth more than three bucks. Athletic Greens was created when the founder experienced a ton of gut health issues and ended up on a complicated supplement routine to recover. I'm sure you're aware that there may be a connection between poor gut health and dementia, so this is another way to help protect your brain. As caregivers to someone with a cognitive impairment, this is also an excellent way to get much needed nutrition into someone who is slowly losing the ability to eat. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D, which is also important for brain health, and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is go to athleticgreens.com slash emerging. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash emerging to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Now back to our conversation. Well, I will say there's different personality types. The majority of people I think are going to do better with taking it one step at a time and doing slow and easy and taking their time. Some people do great with the sudden change. That's how I did it, but that's my personality type. But if it is going to be one step that you're willing to make, I think the easiest, most accessible and biggest bang for your buck is going to be the dairy starting with your milk. So if you are used to either drinking milk or putting it in your cereal or putting it in your coffee, start trying plant-based milks. There's over 20 available. Oh my. <laughs> and most, even small towns, we travel a lot and I live in a smaller town. Even small towns have at least a couple, two, three options. If you don't like one, try another, but this is going to be a great place to start. Also, you know, there's going to be some cheese alternatives, but like we were talking about before you hit record, we can use whole plant foods to make the cheesy, creamy experience that we're after that's going to have the fiber and it's going to have the antioxidants. And you're not going to miss the cheese once you start cooking in this way. So I would say start with the dairy just because it really is our number one source of saturated fat. We just eat a lot of it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We eat a lot of cheese. We eat a lot of yogurt. We eat a lot of this stuff that has really high saturated fat. And because we're so used to it, people don't even realize like they're shocked when they hear that statistic. And then I would say, just take it one meal at a time. So you, you tackled the dairy, you're feeling good. You're on board with that. Then maybe breakfast next. How can you make your breakfast plant-based really simple? If you like more of a sweet breakfast, oatmeal, overnight oats with berries, with some nuts in there, you know, you drizzle your plant milk on there. If you want a, a little bit of sweetener, you can put some on. And so that's a good sweet option, or you can do a savory option, 
tofu scramble or a potato and chickpea scramble with some spinach. I mean, it's delicious. Wrap it in a whole grain tortilla. You're good to go. So that's where I would go next is breakfast. And then just for a couple of weeks or for a month, just every breakfast or at least five or six days a week, make it plant-based. When you're feeling comfortable with that, move on to the next meal and the next meal. And there's different ways to do it. Like I said, you don't have to be a hundred percent plant-based. Some people opt for it, especially if they have a chronic condition and they want to see whether it's going to make enough difference that they could potentially reverse that condition. It's worth going all in and trying to see whether it's going to make a difference. But for everybody else that wants to decrease their risk, wants to prevent if you can aim for 75%, that would be great. So you could do something like weekday plant-based. So Monday through Friday, you eat plant-based on the weekends. You have a little bit more flexibility um, or some, what I call social omnivores, which is at home, you keep it plant-based, but when you go out to eat with your friends or you go to parties, you don't worry about it. You're not telling people, oh, I don't eat that. I don't eat that. You know, you can pick and choose. This might work for some personality types too, that they feel uncomfortable talking about those kinds of dietary changes. So there's no right or wrong approach. And as we were talking about earlier, you found in your own life that whenever you made a dietary change, your body, your taste buds, your brain adapted, right? So mm, that's oh, called yeah. neuroadaptation. This happens to everybody. So you may feel frustrated at first. If you're used to having bacon eggs with a bunch of cheese and hash browns, you know, greasy hash browns for breakfast, and then you go and just have a bowl of fruit, your system's going to be a little shocked. You're going to be like, this is never going to taste good enough for me. If you keep doing that in a couple of weeks, it's going to taste like an amazing, sweet, delicious dessert. Your brain, your taste buds adapt. You just have to give it time. And just like yourself, you look back and you're like, whoa, I cannot believe I love this food and it tastes so delicious when in the past, there's no way I would have thought this was delicious. So you do have to be patient with yourself and then just remember and remind yourself that the brain is amazing and it has the ability to neuroadapt. So when you make changes like this, just be patient with it. That's what I did. And I, let's see, so I had started the lower fat nutrition in August of 2010, I believe it was. And in September, so like right around 9-11, my business bank account got hacked. Mm -hmm. And, the, you know, the banks, because of security, understandably, they're like, we got to shut this all down. I'm like, you cannot shut it down because there are payments that come out every week for vendors that are, you know, that I, I can't just unplug them. You know, I don't, I can't write them a check because they're, you know, we do everything online. And that was 12 years ago, or a little more than, a little more than 12 years ago. And I am not, my husband is a, was in banking for 20 years and he's now a real estate broker. So he can speak to these people. I just immediately go to a 15 on a scale of one to 10 in the frustration. <laughs> and I remember very, very vividly all I wanted to do. And thank God I didn't have one in the house. I wanted to curl up on the couch and cry while sucking on a Hershey bar. <laughs> and I knew, I knew that really wasn't going to help. And I didn't have a Hershey bar because those are, you know, like you said, a lot of fat in those, but I did have raspberries and I put on, um, like maybe a tablespoon of Hershey syrup, which does not have fat in it, which I was very surprised. And that was amazing. And it fixed the, I wanted to suck on a Hershey bar, like a pacifier feeling. <laughs> But I was thinking and in my head, adult pacifier, that's exactly. what chocolate is, right? <laughs> and see, I don't drink because for most of my adult life, or close to half of it, I guess, well, two-thirds of it so far, sugar was my thing, you know? And so I just made the decision that, you know, if I, you know, like today we're recording on Cinco de Mayo, and, you know, if I have a margarita, which a lot of sugar, and you know, the traditional Mexican meals, which is a lot of fat because there's a lot of cheese and, you know, they cook the refried beans in lard, which bleh, <laughs> makes, I can't even think about it. My brain would immediately be like, we have gone too far on the salt fat scale. Now we need the chocolate. So, you know, so now you've got, you've eaten 
too much sugar in the alcohol, too much fat in your meal, and you still want dessert? No. <laughs> so that was my decision was I will skip the alcohol so I can have a brownie. Plus, I've always made the joke that you do not get pulled over while driving on cake. <laughs> because, you know, it doesn't affect your brain like alcohol does. <laughs> but I am re I am one of those people who could eat straight up buttercream frosting plain happily to somebody who's like my daughter got married last weekend and I ended up with the small piece of cake and I was totally fine with it. And it blows my mind still that I am one of those people that it's like, you know, just a really good piece of chocolate or a really tasty small slice of cake on a special occasion. That's enough. Cause I used to think those people were insane. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean a small bite of a good brownie? No, no. You want the whole thing, right? Like the whole three inch square brownie, <laughs> <laughs> which is really bad. Cause we're talking fat and sugar. So you really can change your brain will adapt and, we were talking earlier that, you know, my brain doesn't want beef as much. It doesn't want chicken as much. So it, and I think we're not wanting the cheese as much. So my brain is telling me to go this direction, which I find really fascinating. So, but it's been a journey of 12 years of, you know, reducing fat, reducing meat, re increasing veggies and trying new things. Like you were talking about the tofu chickpea scramble. Mm -hmm. My husband loves to make scramble nor a normal scramble with potatoes and peppers and onions and eggs. And he's kind of killed me for, it. we've had it so much. I am the kind of person that likes a lot of variety and I need a different variety. So I think I may, I may have to add the chickpeas and maybe the tofu. I'm not a huge tofu person. I'm going to have to work on making that better. Might have to add that with some eggs just to kind of ease us into it. But we've had some chickpea. I made a chickpea casserole a couple months ago and it was pretty good. So it is, it was, and we're, let's see, we've got a roasted broccoli. Is it a quesadilla? I don't know. There's a new recipe I just pulled out from the brain health kitchen. That's, um, sounds really good. And, you know, and I, we were, <clears throat> I don't know if we mentioned this, but the making the, the queso, like the cheese sauce from cashews mm -hmm. is incredible. It's, well, you put in nutritional yeast. That's where the cheesy flavor comes mm -hmm. from. It's insane how good that stuff is. Very good. <laughs> I'm going to have to look up, unless you have a recipe, look up one for like the, the cashew cheese replacement, like a cheesy sauce. Am I making sense? Like a, a bechamel sauce. So it's well, basically che yeah. cheese and flour and yeah. Well, milk. Bechamel, bechamel is is like a milky, creamy sauce. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. If they do use cheese, they'll use like a little maybe parmesan or something in there. But it's not like that yellow nacho cheese. But yeah, you could definitely do it with cashews, and I've done it. So cashews, water, garlic powder, um, and then a little bit of acid. So a little bit of lemon juice or something like that. It's actually very, very simple. Or you can use to make it get it to that next level, roast the garlic first, and then use your know, fresh roasted garlic. And it's amazing. And I'm so going to have it try that, I like to make my own pasta mm -hmm. and I'm hoping that life is kind of settling down. It's been a little insane the last couple months. So I'm hoping it's settling down so I can go back to that because it tastes so much better. And I make it whole wheat. I've got a whole wheat flour blend that just amazing. Wow. That sounds good me. It really is. And it's, you know, what's amazing is most, most pastas are either the flour and the eggs or flour and water. Mm -hmm. It's like the, like two ingredient recipe. It's really amazing. And it's amazing how much better it tastes and it's, and it cooks different. It like floats. It's just, it's, I, I need, now I'm making myself hungry. <laughs> <laughs> So what other suggestions do you have for people who are concerned about brain health, maybe avoiding diabetes, but they're taking care of people, maybe they're still working sandwich generation and they're like, I don't have time to like change my whole eating routine. Yeah. You, it, you don't have to make it complicated. You can keep it really simple. I'm busy too. A mom of 
two kids. I run multiple businesses. You know, I'm running around all over the place. And so I understand. I know what that's like. Most of the time, it's just like, is my head on straight today? <laughs> you know, that's how busy I am. But I keep it simple. I keep my meal super simple. I eat the same breakfast most mornings. So I either do an overnight oats or a very quick, you know, oats that I can make with rolled oats and my berries and everything in there. And my lunch is usually either a rice grain bowl with beans and a sauce and, you know, greens in there, or I have a big salad for lunch. And then dinner, we have, you know, our little technique, but the key to making all of these things fast is batch cooking. So when you start batch cookie, it feels overwhelming because you've never done it this way. You've never made a bunch of food at once, but once you get the hang of it, it gets easier and easier. And the biggest payoff is that your week goes by so much smoother. There's less cleaning you have to do in the kitchen because you're not pulling out all of these things to cook every single day. And it's so much less stressful because you always have food. So I'm batch cooking grains, I'm batch cooking beans, I'm batch cooking potatoes, either white potatoes or sweet potatoes, definitely always a sauce and or a salad dressing. You can batch cook your or batch prep all of your greens that you're going to use for the week and your veggies, roast some veggies, cut everything up, get it ready. And it just makes everything so much simpler. Yes, you have to invest a little time. It's gonna, it's going to take a little time on your part to do all this stuff. And but once you get the hang of it, it's not really more time consuming than going to fast food multiple times a week. Cause I actually timed it out. One time it was like a Friday and the kids wanted fast food. We usually eat out on Fridays. The kids wanted fast food, but I actually did not want fast food. So I was like, you know, I'm gonna make my meal. I was done making the meal that I was going to eat at the same time as them before my husband came back with the fast food. So actually I say, if I wouldn't, you know, if I would have been the person to go get fast food, it would have taken me longer. I actually saved time by making that meal. That was way more nutritious, very satisfying. And of course, better for my health. And I'm not demonizing fast food because there's a place for it. And it's, you know, definitely works into our lifestyle, but it's actually a myth that it's a lot faster because once you have the batch cooking down, you're, you're more comfortable in the kitchen, you can do things relatively quickly and it benefits your health. So we do have to put a little time in there, but it's worth it because what we're going for is well-being, longevity, and joy. And it's the consistency of these habits that's going to get us there. Totally. I learned the, that go rushing out to get you know a pizza or fast food, which I have not eaten fast food in I cannot remember how long it's because there's not good choices and it makes me feel gross. So I don't do it. But my husband, you know, it's like, oh, we forgot to defrost something. Our daughter was like two, two and a half. So that tells you how long this has been. <laughs> and he's like, I'm just going to I'm, I'm just going to go get a pizza. It's faster. And it wasn't faster. I timed it. I did the same thing you did. I timed it I'm like, you know what? This nonsense isn't faster. It's definitely not cheaper. And, you know, in the long run, you know, if you spend a little extra time, 10 or 15% more time making healthy meals, I think you're saving yourself time in the long run because you're not, you know, <laughs> present company excluded, rushing off to the doctor all the time because you're, you've got health issues or, you know, now you have to make special nutritional decisions because you've got health issues it's just insane. Mm -hmm. So if you've got, I'm going to ask one more question just because yeah. I am going to make my husband listen to this because <laughs> he's, he's the biggest barrier to making this change, but he has embarked again on a weight loss bodybuilding journey, which I like this person better because their, uh, their nutritional suggestions are smarter and, but they really want people to up the protein because that's what you need to build muscles from what I understand. Please correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> but how would you, so you've got a, my husband's six foot two, he's over 200 pounds. He's a big guy. So how do you get enough plant-based protein to create a more, I don't want to say more appealing physique. Cause that makes it sound like he doesn't look good now, but you know, the physique he's going for and to feel full when he's doing these heavy workouts. Yeah. I'm, I'm throwing her a big curveball. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I will say that one of the things that I talk about a lot is protein because 
this question comes up, even in pediatrics, we're protein obsessed. For the most part, the average citizen is not going to have any problem getting enough protein with a whole food plant-based diet, as long as they're eating enough. So if you're trying to do a severe calorie deficit, it's hard to get enough protein because you're just not consuming enough period. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, there's two other categories that we need to talk about when it comes to protein as well. One is our senior citizens. So once you get to be above the age of 65, you actually don't absorb protein as well as when you were younger. And it has to do with our gut and efficiency and, you know, things just slow down a little bit and you know, it just happens <laughs> when we age. So you may need to be a little bit more mindful of getting sufficient protein. The other thing that happens with older adults is that they may lose their appetite a bit. And so then they're eating less. And so that also affects how much total protein you're taking in. But for that group, it's still not that difficult. Just make sure that you're getting beans, you're incorporating things like tofu, you know, um, some of these higher protein whole plant foods. You're just more mindful of making sure you're incorporating them regularly instead of just eating a bunch of, you know, veggies and grains. All whole plant foods have protein. They just are in different percentages, right? Varying percentages. So some foods have more than others, things like tofu and tempeh, which are soy, um, more minimally processed soy products are going to have more protein, but there's lots of other foods. Then the third category is gonna be athletes. So this is a unique category because especially if you're a competitive athlete, you're just burning a ton of calories. And so for this group, there may be a place for using some supplements and not supplements, I'm talking about not vitamins, but things like protein powders and things like that, mostly because it's just difficult to get enough volume in to replace all your calories and make sure you're getting your protein because it's just hard to eat that much food, especially if you're busy all day and doing that stuff. Um, and then if you are also trying to increase your muscle mass in a competitive way, like if you are a bodybuilder or somebody like that, and you're really trying to increase your protein, then there might be a place for something like that. But you can definitely also use, like I said, tofu, tempeh. There's also something called textured vegetable protein, which you can even buy this at your grocery store, or order on Amazon, where it's like pea protein or chickpea protein, and it's dehydrated and it's really yummy. And you just rehydrate it with water and put all your spices in. It's actually minimally processed. It's not as processed as people would think because it's just one ingredient basically. Um, but it's really yummy and it has that texture that you can put it into tacos and you know your wraps and things like that. So there's definitely products out there that for that category of people that you know, they feel like they need to get a certain amount, you know, <laughs> a certain grams of protein per day that they can achieve that through a plant-based diet instead of just having to eat pounds and pounds and pounds of chicken, which, you know, like I said, the saturated fat also no fiber and no antioxidants really. So you're not benefiting from consuming the plant foods there. But as far as how much protein somebody needs, I think there's just a lot of different opinions out there. And I'm definitely not a personal trainer. I'm not an expert in that, but I will say that I am skeptical about the people that say that you need like two grams per pound or per kilo of body weight. You'll see, you'll see some people say per pound, some people say per kilo, which two grams per pound of body weight is a lot, but there's some people that'll say that. So, you know, you just kind of have to try it out for yourself. If somebody isn't really going out there to try to compete and they're like literally trying to compete in these physique things, they just want to get healthier. They just want to build more muscle. Just eat a whole food plant-based diet eat when you're hungry, stop when you're satisfied and work out. Yeah, that doing is that. the key. Okay. The key is you've got to lift the weights. Okay. There's no magical amount of protein that's going to make your muscles bigger <laughs> if you're not lifting weights. And so that's the thing. I think a lot of people think, okay, if I just eat all this protein, my muscles are going to get, no, that's not how it works. <laughs> oh, you'll <laughs> you get bigger, to, but actually, not from muscle. <laughs> you will get bigger. <laughs> um, so 
most people are in that category. Most people are not in this competitive athlete physique people, which has its own set of, you know, things to talk about. Um, so I would say that for most people, I don't think you need to worry about it that much. Good to know. I think when I was losing all the weight, it was like half a gram per body weight, per pound of body weight, but it's been a long time. I just, you'll I see find, all over the range of recommendations. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, it's just, I don't want that much animal meat anymore. So I, I just, I do what you said, eat when I'm hungry and stop what I f mostly feel full, you know, satisfied, you know, not full, full. Cause it's amazing how 20 minutes later you're like, oof, I'm still full. You know, <laughs> it's like, thought I was going to need more, but I don't. And so that's, you know, I just, I think the brain is so fascinating, you know, that you can, you know, it, it adapts. Like you said, you know, your taste, it'll, I've told a lot of people, your taste buds will change. They don't believe me. So thank you for telling them that it will, <laughs> because I thought it may, maybe it was just me and it's not. So I guess I'm not special. No, <laughs> it's evidence-based. They can look up the research. This is really something that happens in humans, which is a great gift that we have. Yeah. Because it's so much easier to eat healthy once your brain's like, Oh, I like this better. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not craving ice cream every night. <laughs> that was my big downfall. And I haven't had ice cream in forever. I'll have occasional frozen yogurt and that's about it. So is there any last tidbits you want to share with the audience? And then also please tell them about your podcast. Sure. She did say she had multiple businesses. That's one of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to give a couple of book recommendations. If awesome. You're okay with that. Mm -hmm. So this is a really good book. The, oh, the Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's Solution. I don't know if you've read this one. No, so I have not read that one. This is my um, a husband and wife team. They're both medical doctors. They both specialize in Alzheimer's. That is their passion in life. Doctors Dean and Aisha Shirzai, they're in California. And they have a second book that's already out that has all the recipes and they are amazing. So if you are a gourmet cook, definitely check out their, I think it's called the Alzheimer's Solution diet or something like that. But anyway, you can find it through the Alzheimer's solution. So I highly recommend this book. As you can see, I've got lots of little <laughs> tabs and stuff in here. You can even do um, your risk assessment to see what your risk is. And it's got really great graphs of like things that are you know, on the nutrition spectrum that are going to be beneficial and things that could potentially be harmful or neutral. So I highly recommend this book. And then the second one that I recommend one of my favorites is How mm -hmm. Not to Die by Dr. <laughs> Michael Greger. This is not How Not to Die ever because we're not immortal, okay, unfortunately, but it is How Not to Die of the top 10 or 15 causes of death in our country. Like basically, how can you modify your risk of chronic conditions? And chapter three is all about how not to die from brain diseases. So in there, it includes dementia, but also things like stroke and things like that. But this is all evidence-based so for all the people out there that they're like, no, I'm not doing anything unless you give me the evidence. This is where you go. <laughs> this is the Bible of how plant-based nutrition can decrease our risk of chronic disease. So that's um, the resources I would recommend. And as far as how to find me, you can find me at my Instagram at the Dr. Yami spelled out D-O-C-T-O-R-Y-A-M-I. And then my website is dryami.com. And my podcast is called Veggie Doctor Radio because I like talking about veggies. And I also have a book myself. It's called A Parent's Guide to Intuitive Eating, How to Raise Kids Who Love to Eat Healthy. So for grandparents, aunts and uncles, moms, dads, anybody feeding kids, it's a great resource because it tells you not just you know, maybe what we should be feeding kids, but the focus is how we can feed kids and how can we start to teach them these habits and support intuitive eating and these healthy habits that will lead to that well-being, joy, and longevity that we're all seeking. Awesome. And I love that, you know, longevity and joy. So there's yes. no point in living a long life if you feel like crap. <laughs> no way. No, nope. we want to feel good. <laughs> awesome. Well, I appreciate this. And now I'm going to probably go alter tonight's menu to make it a plant-based taco instead Yay! of the other thing. I hope the <laughs> husband's on board. So you, you said that it was a, um, the, the pea protein. Yeah. 
I got this on amazon.com because I also am so busy that I don't actually go to any store to shop. <laughs> I have to order everything, but these are noble plate meatless crumbles. This is what it looks like. The bag looks like, and it has quite a bit. It has three cups of the crumbles in here. And it's just one ingredient. It's non-GMO pea protein. That's all it is. And it's really yummy. I'm telling you, I cook really, really good at my house, but my kids and my husband were impressed because we have been using this for our taco nights and things like that. But all you do is you get a cup of the crumbles, you mix it with half, half a cup of hot water, wait a few minutes, and then use it like you would ground beef or ground chicken or something like that. Excellent, excellent texture. But for the people that are concerned about protein, okay, I don't <laughs> emphasize or overemphasize protein, but in one cup of the pea protein, it's got 45 grams of protein. So probably that sounds like a it lot. Be, it's a lot, you know, you're not going to eat a whole cup of this because it's extremely filling, but you could probably eat half a cup easily. I mean, especially if you put it in a salad or in one of your bowls with a lot of greens and stuff in it, but yeah, I love it. Noble. Plate okay. I'm going to go. We have a, an employee owned market that it's not quite as large as your, your Safeways and your, you know, your main mainstream markets. That sounds, that's not quite the right phrase, but it's, it's got a lot of good stuff. So I'm going to run over there and check it out because um, I'm interested and I really don't like ground beef that much anymore either. So I just don't tell that to the hubby. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is going to be different because it doesn't have that high fat in it, you know, but it's got great texture and it's very filling. So yeah, let me know what you think after you try it, Jennifer. Awesome. Well, I appreciate this and we're going to let Dr. Yami run off to her 50 other things she has to do <laughs> this morning, this afternoon, not quite afternoon yet. And I appreciate the wisdom and advice and good luck with everything you're doing. Thank you so much for having me and have a fantastic day. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.